Coming up on Space Time, discovery of a massive brown dwarf. Inner space set to launch into orbit from Australia's Northern Territory. And Australia's Defence Force moves forward with a major purchase of Tomahawk cruise missiles. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a giant new brown dwarf some 80 times the mass of Jupiter. The find, reported on the pre-press physics website archive.org, is located in a binary system 445 light years away. Brown dwarfs are failed stars, objects which don't have enough mass to sustain the core hydrogen fusion process that makes other stars shine. However, brown dwarfs do fuse deuterium, a heavy form of hydrogen which includes a neutron as well as the core proton in the nucleus. And brown dwarfs more than 65 Jovian masses, such as this one, can also fuse lithium. At 80 Jovian masses, this newly discovered brown dwarf is right on the stellar-substellar boundary, only just below the hydrogen burning limit. The object's effective surface temperature is estimated to be 1,691 Kelvin. While some brown dwarves start their lives as brown dwarves, others actually start their lives as spectral type M red dwarf stars. But as they burn through their nuclear fuel supplies, they lose enough mass during their evolution to cease core fusion, turning them from red dwarves into brown dwarves. Brown dwarves fit into a category between the largest planets, which have about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smaller spectrotype M red dwarf stars, which are usually around 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or 0.08 solar masses. This discovery, designated as ZTF J2020 plus 5033, was made by the Zwicky Transient Facility. Zwicky scans the night skies looking for transient astronomical objects. The brown dwarf was discovered in a binary orbit with a low mass spectral type M red dwarf star. It has an orbital period of just 1.9 hours, making it the shortest period known transiting brown dwarf ever detected. The primary star in the system has a radius of 0.176 solar radii and a mass of about 0.134 solar masses. The star has an effective surface temperature of 2,856 Kelvin, making it a fairly typical red dwarf star. This is space time. Still to come, inner space set to launch into orbit from Australia's Northern Territory, and Australia moves forward with plans to purchase Tomahawk cruise missiles. All that and more still to come on Space Time. South Korean rocket launch company InnerSpace is set to become the first long-term tenant based at Equatorial Launch Australia's spaceport in the Northern Territory's Arnhem Land. The deal will see a variety of orbital launch vehicles carrying payloads ranging from 50 to 500 kilograms float into low Earth orbit from the Arnhem Space Centre starting in early 2025. The decision to proceed follows the successful launch of three NASA-sounding rockets from the Gove Peninsula complex last year. Over 70 NASA staff travelled down under from the Wallops Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast to work on the project, which saw a series of scientific payloads launched on suborbital ballistic trajectories. Inner Space and Equatorial Launch will now work with the Australian Space Agency to obtain a launch permit from the Department of Civil Aviation, Australia's version of America's FAA. The news comes in the wake of a separate deal for a dedicated launch site between Equatorial Launch and the American Space Transportation and Rocket Manufacturing Company, Phantom Space Corporation. That also follows in the wake of the NASA launches last year, which were the first from a commercial spaceport outside the United States. Until now, the Australian Defence Force's Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia was the nation's only true space launch complex. In fact, back during the 1960s, during the heyday of the space race, Woomera was the second busiest spaceport in the world, eclipsed only by Cape Canaveral. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Australian continent, Southern Launch has received approval to continue work on its new rocket test range at Cuniba, west of Sejuna in South Australia. 
Kinibo will complement Southern Launch's planned orbital launch complex at Whaler's Way, south of Port Lincoln. When fully operational, Kinibo will be one of the largest commercial rocket testing facilities in the world, allowing suborbital missions to conduct experiments and validate space technology. Although things haven't gone all that smoothly of late, Southern Launch says it does have a number of missions set to launch from the range over the next few years, including several flights this year and the German Space Agency's Reflex mission in 2024. The range will also be used for the re-entry of spacecraft, which up until now were forced to use the warmer rocket range. In fact, British-based Spaceforge is planning to use the Kniba test range as a re-entry point for their new spacecraft. This Space Time. Still to come, Australia moves forward with the purchase of hundreds of Tomahawk cruise missiles. And the September equinox, the constellations Capricorn and Aquarius and the Epsilon Perseus meteor showers will continue to dominate the night skies of September on Skywatch. The Australian Defence Forces agreed to purchase hundreds of long-range Tomahawk cruise missiles from Raytheon as part of a $1.7 billion program. The initial deployment will see 220 Block 4 Tomahawks, which have a range of over 1,500 kilometres, assigned to the Navy's Aegis Hobart-class destroyers. The deal means Australia will become only the third nation in the world, after the United States and Great Britain, to have a Tomahawk long-range strike capability. Later deployments will also see Tomahawks assigned to Australian nuclear submarines, which are yet to be built. But plans to refit the existing Collins-class submarines to take Tomahawks have been put on hold for now. The deal will also see the Air Force acquire Argamer Extended Range Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missiles for use on F-35A Lightning II Stealth Fighters and both F-A-18 Super Hornets and F-A-18 Growlers. The American-made air-to-ground missiles are designed to target enemy radar systems. Meanwhile, the Army's Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Vehicles will be armed with new Spike Long Range 2 anti-tank guided missiles, which will enable troops to engage the enemy at ranges of more than 5 kilometres. The new missile announcements come on top of news that the acquisition of HIMARS, that is High Mobility Arterial Rocket System launches, will double from initial 21 to at least 42 sets. About $1.6 billion will be spent on expanding and accelerating the acquisition of the land-based long-range surface-to-surface HIMARS as well as associated munitions and support systems. The project also includes the PRSM Precision Strike Missile, which is expected to have a range of over 500 kilometres. Australia's latest defence acquisitions come as China increases its military build-up in the Pacific, which has seen further aggressive actions in the South China Sea against neighbouring countries, the ongoing build-up of its navy, which is now the largest in the world, a major increase in Chinese air power, which is only kept in check by the fact that the West has a 20 to 1 kill ratio advantage over the best Generation 5 Chinese technology, and China's nuclear missile development program, which is expected to reach over 3,000 nuclear warheads by the end of the decade. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the night skies for September on Skywatch. September was the seventh month of the year in the old Roman calendar, which had just 10 months. That's before the addition of January and February. That 10-month year is still reflected today in the name September or Septum being Latin for seven. October, Octo meaning eight. November and Novem, nine. And December or Deci meaning ten. It really wasn't until the Gregorian calendar that January the 1st marked the start of the new year, but in the beginning it was mostly only Catholic countries that adopted it. Protestant nations only gradually moved across, with the British, for example, not adopting the Reformed calendar until 1752. Prior to that date, the British Empire and its American colonies still celebrated the new year on March the 25th, marking the Feast of the Annunciation and Easter. 
The earliest recordings of a New Year celebration are believed to have taken place in Mesopotamia around 2000 BCE, around the time of the Northern Hemisphere vernal equinox in mid-March. A variety of other dates tied to the seasons are also used by various ancient cultures. The Egyptians, Phoenicians and Persians began their New Year off with the fall equinox, and the Greeks celebrated it on the winter solstice. While the Jewish New Year, or Rosh Hashanah, the Festival of Trumpets, occurs in September, where it marks the beginning of the Northern Hemisphere's cycle of sowing, growth and harvest, and apparently the creation of Adam and Eve, according to the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. The astronomical highlight of the month is the September equinox, which this year takes place at 16.50 in the afternoon of Saturday, September the 23rd, Australian Eastern Standard Time. That's 2.50 in the morning of Saturday, September 23rd, U.S. Eastern Daylight Time and 6.50 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. The day marks the point in Earth's orbit around the Sun when the planet's rotational axial tilt means the Sun will appear to rise exactly due east to someone standing on the equator. It means almost equal hours of darkness and light. In fact, the word equinox is derived from the Latin, meaning aquinas or equal, and nox meaning night. It all comes about because Earth's rotational axis is tilted at an angle of around 23.4 degrees in relation to the ecliptic, the plane created by Earth's orbit around the Sun. And Earth's axial tilt is pointed to the same direction in the sky, regardless of Earth's orbital position around the Sun. So on other days of the year, either the northern or southern hemisphere are tilted more towards the Sun. But on the two equinoxes, around March the 21st and September 23rd, the tilt of Earth's axis is directly perpendicular to the sun's rays. For those in the northern hemisphere, it means the start of fall or autumn, while those of us south of the equator are moving into spring. Now it's also worth noting that on geological timescales, the solstices and equinoxes change because of a process called precession which causes Earth's spinning axis to wobble, like the axle of a spinning top. The rate of precession is only about half a degree per century, so people don't notice it on human timescales. But because the direction of Earth's axis of rotation determines at which point in Earth's orbit the seasons occur, precession will cause a particular season to occur at a slightly different time from year to year over a 21,000 year cycle. Of course, as well as precession, the Earth's orbit itself is also subjected to small changes called perturbations. That's because Earth's orbit's an ellipse, and so there's a slow change in its orientation, which gradually shifts the point of perihelion, Earth's closest orbital position to the Sun. Now, these two effects, the precession of the axis of rotation and the change in the orbit's orientation, work together to shift the seasons with respect to perihelion. And because we use a calendar year that's aligned to the occurrence of the seasons, the date of perihelion will gradually regress through this 21,000-year cycle, unless we compensate for it. OK, let's start our tour of the September night skies by looking towards the east and the constellation of Capricornus the goat. The name comes from the ancient Greek tale about the demon Typhon emerging from a fissure in the earth and attacking Zeus, the king of gods, during a banquet. The sudden appearance of Typhon scared Pan, the flute-playing goat boy, who tried to escape by turning into a fish and swimming away. However, he realized his cowardice before completing the transformation, and so distracted the demon by playing his flute instead. And this gave Zeus enough time to use a thunderbolt from the heavens to frighten Typhon away. Because of his actions, both cowardly and brave, Zeus placed Pan in the sky forevermore still in his half-goat, half-fish guise. The brightest star in Capricornus is Delta Capricorni, also known as Denebal Jetty, or the Tail of the Goat. It's a near neighbour, located just 39 light-years away. A light-year is about 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit across the universe. Denebal Jetty is a spectral type A white beta Lyra variable eclipsing binary. It's comprised of two stars closely orbiting each other. Now, astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars. 
They're followed by spectral type B blue white stars, then spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars. That's where our sun fits in. Then there's spectral type K orange stars. And the coolest and least massive stars are known as spectral type M red dwarf stars. Each spectral classification can also be subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with zero being the hottest and nine the coolest, and a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. Now put all that together, and our Sun is officially classified as a spectral type G2V or G25 yellow dwarf star. As we mentioned earlier, Denebel Jetty is a Beta Lyra variable eclipsing binary system. It's made up of two stars closely orbiting each other. The total brightness of the system changes because the two component stars periodically pass in front of each other as seen from Earth, thereby blocking out the light from the other star in the system. The two component stars of Beta Lyra systems are usually massive giants or supergiants, so close to each other that their shapes are heavily distorted by their mutual gravitational forces. This gives each of the stars in the system an ellipsoidal shape with extensive mass flows from one component to the other. Just below Capricornus on the eastern horizon, you'll see the constellation Aquarius, the water carrier to the gods. Greek mythology describes Aquarius as the most beautiful looking boy that ever lived, and so was carried from Earth up to Mount Olympus by Zeus in the guise of Aquila the Eagle to become the water carrier. The two brightest stars in Aquarius are Alpha and Beta Aquarii, a pair of luminous yellow supergiants that were once spectral type B blue-white stars. The pair are moving through space perpendicular to the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Beta Aquarii, the brightest of the pair, is also known as Sidal Sud. It's a multiple star system, located about 540 light years away. The primary star is about six times the mass of the Sun, but emits roughly 2,300 times the Sun's luminosity, implying a radius at least 50 times that of our Sun. Beta Aquarii appears to have at least two faint companion stars, but you'll need a decent-sized telescope to see them. The second brightest star in Aquarius is Alpha Aquarii, also known as Sidal Melik. It's about 520 light years away, around six and a half times as massive as the Sun, and some 3,000 times as luminous. Next, we move to the southern constellation of Pisces Astrinus, the southern fish. The brightest star in the constellation is Formalholt, the mouth of the southern fish, and the 18th brightest star in the night sky. Interestingly, thousands of years ago, it was used to mark the position of the winter solstice, the Sun's most southerly position as seen from the northern hemisphere. But the precession of the equinoxes, which we talked about earlier, has now moved the northern winter solstice to its new position in December. Located only 25 light years away, Formalhort is a spectral type A white yellow star, about twice the mass of the Sun and around 16 times as luminous. It's also a really young star, only about 400 million years old. By comparison, our own star, the Sun, is some 4.6 billion years of age. Formalhort exhibits an excess of infrared radiation, indicating that it's surrounded by a circumstellar disk. It's also part of a triple star system, together with a spectral type K orange dwarf star TW Pisces Ostrini and a spectral type M red dwarf star LP876-10. Turning to the north now, there you'll see the constellation Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek mythology. Pegasus is the one who delivered Medusa's head to Polydectes, after which he travelled to Mount Olympus in order to become the bearer of thunder and lightning bolts for Zeus. The brightest star in Pegasus is the orange supergiant Epsilon Pegasi, which marks the horse's muzzle. Almost 12 times the mass of the sun, it's bloated out to a spectral type K supergiant nearing the end of its life. Astronomers are still debating as to whether it will end its days as a core collapse supernova or a rare neon oxygen white dwarf. Also in the north is the constellation Cygnus the Swan, which lies on the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Cygnus contains the star Deneb, one of the brightest stars in the night sky and one of the corners of the summer triangle. It's also home to the giant Cygnus OB2 Stellar Association, which includes one of the largest known stars in the universe, MNL Cygni, a red hypergiant, about 1,183 times the radius and 50 times the mass of our Sun. 
In fact, were it placed at the centre of our solar system where the Sun is, its surface would extend out beyond the orbit of Jupiter. It's so big, it contains a volume approximately 1.6 billion times that of the Sun. NML Cygni is located about 5,300 light-years away. Now, Cygnus is also home to Cygnus X1, a powerful galactic X-ray source which became the first widely accepted black hole. It was discovered back in 1964, and even today it remains one of the most studied astronomical objects in the sky. The black hole is estimated to have about 14.8 times the mass of our Sun, all crammed into an event horizon with a radius of just 44 kilometres. Little wonder black holes are the densest objects in the universe. Located just above the northern horizon this time of the year is the star Vega. It's the brightest star in the constellation Lyra and the fifth brightest star in the night sky. Vega has about twice the mass of our Sun, and it's a relatively young star, less than 500 million years old, and it's also fairly close, just 25 light years away. Now, once again, due to the precession of Earth's rotational axis, Vega used to be the northern pole star around 14,000 years ago, and it will do so again in another 12,000 years' time. Just above Vega is Alpha Aquilae or Altair, the brightest star in the constellation Aquila. It's a spectral type A white-yellow star with about twice the mass of our Sun. Altair is located really nearby, just 16.7 light-years away and it rotates very rapidly, with an equatorial velocity of about 286 kilometres per second, and that's a significant fraction of the star's estimated breakup speed of around 400 kilometres per second. Now, this high rotation rate means Altair isn't spherical, but highly flattened at the poles. Altair is the eye of the eagle that carried Aquarius up to Mount Olympus to become the water bearer for the gods. Looking to the southeast now, and you'll see the bright star Achenar. It's the brightest star of the constellation Eridanus, the river. Located around 140 light years away, Achenar has seven times the mass and 3,000 times the luminosity of our sun. The star rotates so rapidly it's elliptical in shape, with its equatorial diameter being about 56% wider than its polar diameter. September also sees the bulk of the Origids meteor shower, which is produced as the Earth passes through the debris trail left by the comet Kes C1911N1. Kes is a long-period comet, only reaching the inner solar system every 1800 to 2000 years. Its meteor shower runs between August the 28th and September the 5th. The Origids provide up to five swift and bright meteors an hour, with its peak just before dawn on September the 1st. It's best viewed from the northern hemisphere as its radiant, that is the direction the meteors appear to be coming from, lies in the northern sky constellation of central Aurigia. A second meteor shower in the month of September is the Epsilon Perseids, which run from September the 5th to the 21st. Although they're called the Epsilon Perseids, the radiant actually lies closer to the star Beta Perseus or Algol. Now the Epsilon Perseids should be confused with last month's Perseids meteor shower. That's because while both appear to have their radiant in the constellation Perseus, they're caused by debris trails from two very different comets. Turning now to the planets, and Mars is low in the west in Virgo in the evenings. On September the 16th, a very thin crescent moon will be seen just below Mars, while the next night it'll be above Mars and to the right or north. The other evening planetary sighting will be Saturn, which will be in the east in Aquarius. The gibbous moon will be just below Saturn to the right or north on the 27th. Turning to the morning planets now, and you'll find Venus low in the northeast in Cancer, but moving into Leo during the last week of the month. On September 11, the crescent moon will be to the left or north of Venus. Mercury is out of sight, blocked by the sun's glare, so we can forget about that. But Jupiter will be in the northwest in Aries in the morning, with the gibbous moon just below and Saturn will still be up from the previous night, but very low in the west as it disappears below the western horizon during the final week of the month. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 